Hello, I am making this video as a guide, as a helpful hint for anybody that is trying to plan their wedding during COVID. My husband and I got married on Halloween, October 31st, 2020, during COVID, and we managed to have a safe wedding with zero COVID cases. Zero people got sick from our event, and this was a result of a lot of planning, a lot of communicating. It took a lot of work, but I think it was worth it because we still managed to have a really beautiful wedding, and everybody still had a fantastic time. They had fun, but most importantly, they felt safe. So I'm going to give a little bit of a backstory as to why we didn't just cancel or postpone the wedding, but if you want to skip all of that and get down into, like, the details of actual steps I took on the day of the wedding, you can skip to this time. So we started planning our wedding in December of 2018. Even earlier than that, like we already, he, he proposed July of 2018 on his birthday. He, he proposed. So we were already thinking about a wedding, wedding planning in the summer of 2018. We, we weren't really sure where we wanted it to be. I knew I wanted it on Halloween. Like, I, I grew up fantasizing about having a Halloween wedding, having it kind of, like, spooky and ethereal and people having the option to wear costumes and dress up. So, like, I always knew I wanted a Halloween wedding. There was just no negotiating that. And luckily, my husband was cool with that. He was like, yeah, Halloween sounds great. And there's a family resort that was really close to my husband's side of the family. This place called Woodlock Pines in the Poconos. They have been going there for years. My husband has been going there since he was like two. He brought me a couple of times. I really like it. I like that it's in the middle of the woods, the mountains, the lake. It's in Pennsylvania and my family is, or at least my dad's side of the family, is from Pennsylvania. I spent my childhood in rural Pennsylvania. So Woodlock Pines was like a really pretty place and uh, my mother-in-law made like a like a little passing comment one day she was like oh a woodlock wedding that would be my dream and it just kind of like planted the seed i guess and i was like yeah let's let's do a woodlock wedding that would be cool that would be fun we can invite our friends to stay for the weekend and do all the activities because this resort has a lot of really fun cool activities and i wanted it to feel like fun. I wanted it to be fun, you know. I didn't want it to be like a, a boring, you know, serious wedding. Like, my husband and I are not serious. We're really fun. Uh, me, I am very ch childish. I'm very playful, so I wanted fun. And so in December, that December of 2018, we went to Woodlock and we toured the grounds where we would have the ceremony in front of the lake. Um, at first we were going to have our reception in like a party house and like a big guest house because I wanted all vegan catering and woodlock vegan food not so great. Um, so I wanted to bring in my own catering and they said they don't really allow outside catering. So our workaround was to do it in like a guest house and have like a small, like a smaller wedding and have it in a guest house and that way we could bring in whatever food we wanted. So that was venue number one. Technically, our first venue was a guest house, a really big guest house that we would transform the basement into basically like the reception dining room and like turn the living room into like a dance floor. So we're getting into the weeds of wedding planning and we get on the phone with like the kitchen manager, our event coordinator, our vegan chef, our vegan caterer that we hired and we did our wedding tasting with. And eventually they, we came to an agreement where it was like, you know what, we'll let the New York based vegan caterer use Woodlock's kitchen and we can have a wedding in just the normal venue in the normal like ballroom where they have their weddings and have some Woodlock kitchen staff help out. And we were like, whoa, so cool, makes everything easy. But we had to move things around because we had already like started talking to a decorator and the DJ. So we had to shift some things from the house to the new 
venue. This is venue number two, technically. It's still Woodlock, but we went from a guest house to, like, the standard wedding venue, ballroom, cocktail hour, you know, the, the normal wedding package. So that was not really COVID-related, but we did, that, that was technically a second venue change. I think spring of 2019, we put down our deposit, our first deposit, you know, just, just because we're excited and we want to get the ball rolling so that we don't have to feel rushed. You know, like it's, it's spring of 2019. Our wedding is not until fall of next year, fall of 2020, but we really wanted to not feel rushed. We really wanted to be able to take our time and not feel stressed and not feel pressured. And you know, for 2019, it it seemed to be going that way. It seemed to be going nice and easy. We were able to book things so far in advance. We were able to talk to a whole bunch of vendors. We got our cake out of the way, got the food, got a DJ, the lights, the design, the flowers. Like, we got all these vendors. We were in talks with everybody. And that was just really great. We were able to leisurely plan our wedding and get things done in increments without feeling rushed. So things are pretty much ready to go. The only thing that really needs to happen is that we pay people. And typically you don't really have to pay anybody until, you know, much closer to the date of the wedding. We had some back and forth with like, where will all of our guests stay when they come to Woodlock? Because we rented two guest houses, one of which the party was initially going to be in, but those two guest houses were just going to be for our friends, like our close friends to hang out and sleep over for the weekend and just like party all weekend with us. And then there were some other guest houses, a little like off the property, well, still on the property, but like down the road and like the golf course part of the resort where all the family could rent houses if they wanted to. So we were kind of working out all the details with that, you know, which family is going to stay in which house, how do you want to pay for it, put your money down, you have until October of 2020 to do this, so, you know, no rush, but just think about it, blah blah blah. We were trying to come up with, like, a month, like, like a final, like, absolute, this is the latest that you can confirm and give us your money because we need to book these houses. So we were coming up with, you know, just ways to make everything happen and just make it flow. <laughs> and then COVID becomes a thing. Overnight, it seems. I remember in January or February of 2020, we were hearing about it. Um, I got a cold right at the end of February or beginning of March, and so did my husband or fiancé at the time. He got sick right around February. I caught it from him, and we thought it was a regular cold. For all we know, it could have been COVID. We had we had a lingering cough for a while, but that was about it. You know, I just took day quill and went to rehearsal because I'm a ballet dancer. So, so I just kept going to dance rehearsal. You know, I had no bad symptoms, no, no fever. I just took some day quill and went to work. And we were rehearsing for our spring show, our spring season, which was in March. We had a tour. We were going on our first tour to New Hampshire. We were going to tour through this like winery and put on a show while, you know, rich people drank wine and ate dinner or something. And then we had our performance scheduled for like two days after we came back from the tour. So our, our local performance, we went on tour and then we come back and we do our local performance in New York City. And literally the day we are supposed to leave for our New Hampshire tour, we get the message that it's shut down. Everything's shut down. They're shutting down all the theaters. They shut down the winery. Nobody's taking guests anymore. It's not safe. Um, I'm going on a tangent here, but it just goes to show that, like, how the state of the world and the state of your plans can change in a day, can change in hours. Thursday morning, I woke up, took a warm-up ballet class with my coach, packed my bags, was getting ready to leave to go meet the dancers at like a bus station or something wherever we were supposed to meet to like drive to New Hampshire to go to the hotel and that afternoon after my ballet class as I'm getting ready to pack my bags and leave 
we get the message, no tour, no nothing. Like, ev everything just stopped in March, and it was seemingly overnight. And this was before we really knew anything about the virus. So, you know, we're thinking like, oh, this will blow over in like a few weeks, a month tops, we'll be back to dancing by April or May. Ha <laughs> funny, funny. But we still did not suspect at all that it would interfere with our wedding. No, we, we, we didn't even think that it could last that long. So, you know, more and more cases are popping up, more and more people are getting sick, more and more businesses are closing down, and we're starting to get into, like, summer of 2020, and Woodlock did actually shut down for a while. They didn't go out of business, I think they just closed, and, you know, we're not having guests, and we're not, you know, booking rooms or anything for, like, a few months in the spring. It was, like maybe April or May or something, and then they, they kind of figured out how to, how to get around it, how, you know, what can they do, what can they bring outside, outdoors, can they update their ventilation systems, can they make things more COVID safe, more sanitation stations, more CDC guidelines to follow, so like Woodlock eventually like figured out how to safely have people on their property again, um, but we were still concerned, it was like, you know, what how is this going to affect our wedding and they could only really do what the Pennsylvania governor governor wolf said they could do so we're getting we're getting into the late summer now and things are kind of going worse you know i'm checking online every day looking at pennsylvania's numbers looking at wayne county and i see numbers going up and down and up down a little bit up more and i'm like oh no i just i don't know i don't know what's going to happen and so in the summertime, we visit Woodlock and we visit our event coordinator who has already been through so much stuff with us, you know, how we were trying to have this unconventional wedding in a guest house and then bringing in an outside caterer and doing all this weird stuff. Like she had already stuck with us through so much and she was trying to reassure us that we could still have our wedding, still have our wedding, still have fun. And at that point in Pennsylvania, we could only have 50 people attend the wedding. Our original guest list was like 75-ish, but some of that 75 was like extended family that my parents wanted me to invite because it's the right thing to do. I didn't have a relationship with any of these people. These are like aunts and uncles that I wouldn't recognize if I tripped over them. But at that point, it seemed like the guest list was cutting itself. A lot of these extended family members lived out of state. It was getting less and less safe to travel. They would have to quarantine if they came from certain states, certain hot spots. So it, it was naturally becoming more difficult to have all of those 75 guests attend. So we were like, we could, we could do 50. We could do 50. It, it's fine. You know, we can still have a really cool, fun, decent wedding with 50 people. And then Governor Wolf kind of restricted it more but not really. I, I was actually really confused and actually a little bit annoyed because Woodlock contacted us and they were like, we can only do like micro weddings now. We can only do like intimate weddings with only like 10 or 15 people or something. And I didn't understand why because I was reading and researching that other venues were still having weddings of like 50 people or even up to 100 people, as long as it was outside or open air. So, you know, while we don't want to be, like, completely outside on Halloween in Pennsylvania, it'll be kind of chilly, you could rent a tent with walls, or you could have, like, a covered patio with heat lamps. Like, there are ways around it, and Woodlock just did not seem to want to do that. They were like, no, we, we're not doing that, we can't. Like, we can't get a tent. We can't find a tent. We, we legally have to have an indoor plan in case it rains or snows or something. And they, they just did not want to work around that. They didn't want to give us like an open air or like covered outdoor celebration. They just, they just didn't want to. It, it was either like intimate micro wedding or nothing. And I was like, okay, well, I cannot see the point of having a wedding 
if we have to cut that many people from our guest list. Because at that point, it would just be like family and one or two close friends. Like if I had to narrow it down and, and choose one or two friends, like I could, but that would feel weird because, you know, we're close to all of our friends. <laughs> And they have plus ones. And then it was coming down to this thing where, like, oh, we can invite this person, but they can't bring their partner. Uh, but, like, oh, but I'm friends with both the boyfriend and the girlfriend. They're both close friends. So how shitty is that where you invite one couple and then you tell another friend they can't bring their significant... It was just... It just became not worth it to have to cut that many people from our wedding. Especially when there were other options. There were other, like, outdoor, covered outdoor options closer to us, a little easier for everybody to get to in New York instead of having to drive to the Poconos. So we kind of canceled with Woodlock and luckily we got all our money back because you were, you could be refunded as long as you cancel within like X amount of days before the event or something. So that's it, no more Woodlock. We started looking at other venues around New York. We looked at a couple of like open air venues in Long Island City and Brooklyn. But they didn't have the availability, and we were determined to keep the date. I was too, and I had already started ordering custom labels for stuff that says Victoria and Steve, Halloween 2020. Like, I had already spent so much money on Halloween-specific stuff. Like, I had this idea to make everybody's place card on a little pumpkin. And I had already, like, bought all of this fall foliage. And I had already gotten our custom labels, Victoria and Steve, Halloween, wedding, October 31st, 2020, on, like, little trinkets and chapsticks and hand soaps and hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers. It was, it was a good, smart move for me. And there were so many things special about Halloween 2020 that would not happen again for years. Um, Halloween 2020... It's on a Saturday, so, you know, who doesn't love a party on a Saturday? It was on daylight saving, so we technically had an extra hour of partying to, to be married. We had an extra hour of being married. Of We had an extra hour of wedding, and then an extra hour for people to, like, sleep off their hangover the next day if they needed to. And it was also a full moon, a full moon on a Saturday, on Halloween, on daylight savings. So when is when is the next time that that's going to happen? I don't know. My husband did the math. He looked at a calculator like when is the next time all of those things are going to line up again? 40 years or something we'll be dead. Well, no, we'll just be old. So it was Halloween or bust. We were willing to maybe do the Friday before or the Sunday after, but you know, we really wanted to try to find a new venue. So this was three months before the wedding. Three months before the wedding, we canceled with Woodlock and had to like scramble to find a new venue. So I was looking at these open air venues that could cover us or like have a tent or some walls or some heat lamps or something. And they're either super expensive because everything in New York City and Brooklyn and Long Island City particularly very expensive, Manhattan, very expensive. Um, but I stumbled across Queen's Botanical Garden and they had availability and it was affordable and they were still having events. And we went and looked at the property and it seemed like it was going to work. It was really beautiful. It was even like more beautiful than Woodlock because it's a garden, you know, it's manicured uh, with the seasons. So it was looking very seasonal, lots of beautiful plants. And we basically had free run of the place. You know, there were like a few little designated areas for the ceremony and the reception where we would like set up the tables and have dinner and like places where they would set up like bistro tables for cocktail hour and stuff. We had a few designated areas, but once you show up, you can you can tour, walk around the whole garden if you want to. You had free run of the place. You could explore the whole day. You could have some champagne and then ditch the party and go walk across however many acres the garden was and it, it just seemed really cool really pretty it's still aligned with my halloween fairy tale vision pretty ethereal a little spooky but organic like that's it's still lined up with what i wanted as long as i had a pretty wedding <laughs> that's all i really cared about and vegan food as long as i have a pretty wedding and vegan food 
that's really all I cared about. And so things are going good. However, we learned our lesson. We learned that COVID could change your plans, could turn your plans upside down in in 24 hours. So as we went forward with this new venue, we of course requested like a COVID clause, um, something that would guarantee we get our money back if if something changes at the last second, if it's covered Legal scholars said that COVID should be covered under a force majeure clause, so we were just very specific. We tried to be very specific and very careful because we didn't want to get screwed over. And luckily, the venues were pretty understanding of this. We're getting close. We're getting close. We get we get married and we get married in three weeks. And Queen's Botanical Garden says they can no longer have 50 people. Now they can only have like 10 or 15. This, the same thing as Woodlock because we had a couple of hot spots pop up around Brooklyn and Queens and the Queens Botanical Garden fell into that like yellow zone or orange zone or something. If, if Queens Botanical Garden had even been like two miles to the east, it would have been safe. It would have been untouched, probably that could have had 50 people. And they said, we're sorry, we can only have, like, the micro-weddings, the intimate weddings of, like, 10 or 15 people. And I was like, this is why we canceled with Woodlock. This is why we came to you in the first place, was so we didn't have to slash our guest list that drastically. This is, this is three weeks to the wedding now. Three weeks to the wedding. And I'm debating should we cancel everything? Should we should we just cut the guest list in half and just do it with 20 people? Or should we try to find another venue, maybe in Long Island where there's not so many like hot spots where there's fewer covid cases, where things are lower, where rates are lower. And we didn't think it was possible, but 3 weeks was just enough time. So I spent like a straight 12 hours on my phone because my laptop died while this was happening. My motherboard and my laptop fried um, in the midst of wedding planning. So on my phone, I was just searching like every possible venue on Long Island, every single possible venue um, in, like, Nassau County, which is, like, the next county over. We're in Queens, and then Nassau is, like, 20-minute drive. And we somehow got so lucky. This venue called Swan Club on the Harbor in Roslyn, 15 minutes from our apartment, has availability on Halloween, (laughs) and they're willing to work with us. And we were so, so fortunate that all of our vendors, even even though most of those vendors were based in Pennsylvania, they were still willing to make the drive to come do our wedding in Long Island. But, you know, we had to pay them a little extra for gas and hotel sleeping arrangements and stuff like that. But I think it's also because, like, those vendors, those businesses are hurting, too. Like, people are canceling left and right. You know, they need, they need money and they were willing to do a three hour drive from the Poconos area to Nassau County. So a lot of things just fell into place for us. A lot of things worked out magically. Um, We were able to get the venue, get the date, get all the vendors to agree to go there. We were able to keep 50 people. In Nassau County, vendors were still allowed to have 50 people max inside. We did talk about having it outside, we did discuss outdoor options, but as we got closer to the date, it was starting to look like it was going to be kind of cold at night. At the last minute, we kind of shifted everything to be inside, and the venue upgraded us to a really huge ballroom. 
so this wedding venue is kind of like a wedding factory as as some people would put it like that's all they do so they can have like two or three weddings happening at the same venue simultaneously like that is a thing so they have multiple ballrooms multiple cocktail rooms they have patios they have like a little chapel not really chapel i don't know it just kind of looks like a really pretty barn where you can go in and have the ceremony or you could have a ceremony outside they had a lot of options basically and they had nothing else booked for that day. Halloween was empty. I don't know why. Nobody else wanted to get married on Halloween, I guess. So we had a lot of flexibility. And so at the last minute, they they upgraded us to this really huge ballroom. And this is like a really... Um, a serendipitous part of how we were able to keep everybody safe. Um, and that brings me into what we did the day of the wedding or how we prepared the day of the wedding, how we ensured that everybody was as safe as possible, how we pulled off a COVID-free wedding. So at this point, we had talked to a bunch of different event coordinators at a bunch of different venues, and we we had a pretty good idea of what the CDC was doing to keep people safe. So when it came to our guest list, we followed the CDC guidelines and we invited a maximum of 50 people. On the day of, it turned out to be 46 people. And our guest list comprised of only the close friends and family members that we were already communicating with regularly, giving them updates, telling them how we're going to be safe, if we're still going to have this wedding. So in a sense, we already knew what was going on with these friends and family members. We already kind of knew their business. We had a good idea of their whereabouts, if they had been going out or if they were quarantining, had, had they been exposed to anybody. We knew whether or not these people were traveling, but this also means being like a little bit annoying and persistent with your guests too. This means updating them, checking in with them regularly, and being a little pushy, keeping tabs on them. You may alienate some guests, but your priority is the safety of the whole group, not the comfort or the personal choice of like a stubborn few anti-maskers. Your job is to prevent COVID from getting there in the first place. You can't just like kind of like, oh, you know, this this uncle, this cousin, they're a little weird about wearing the mask, but like one person's okay, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it later. No, 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 no. You cannot just like hope for the best and like let that one person slide and tell yourself you'll, you'll mitigate it later. Like, no, your job is to prevent any chance of any COVID coming in at all. You are responsible for the health and safety of this whole group, and this group is only allowed to come to your wedding if they are willing to cooperate with you and follow your rules that you are setting for everybody's health and safety. If you have any friends or family members that are giving you a hard time and trying to push back on your rules and your guidelines and your requirements, and if those people are being so stubborn that they're willing to jeopardize your health and the health of everybody else, you don't want them at your wedding. You don't want them in your life. So at this point, the people that were invited were the people that were being safe, that were being cautious, that were not going out and going on vacation and going partying. Like, we already knew at this point because we had been communicating back and forth for a year about this wedding. We knew which guests were safe to invite estranged, distant relatives that we didn't really communicate with, that we didn't really have a relationship with. Those people were kind of like cut off the guest list, but it, we really didn't even have to uninvite them. They kind of just naturally fell off the guest list because a lot of them were from out of state or they were older or it would be expensive or be an inconvenience for them to quarantine in New York for two weeks before coming to the wedding, which we did require out-of-state family to do. My husband's parents live in Florida, and they had to come up two weeks before to quarantine before they could come to our event. I would say don't worry about canceling with certain friends and family, 
they are more often than not understanding. Some guests were actually like a little bit relieved because it is it is a big ask to ask some of these family members to come from somewhere else to quarantine in New York for two weeks to risk exposure to wear a mask and be inside with a bunch of people that they don't know. N nobody outright said, oh, you know, thank God, I really didn't want to come anyway, I was so scared. Nobody said that, but I got the sense that like, you know, a little bit of a weight was lifted. They just didn't have that, that like, pressure you know, because they feel obligated to go because they're family and you should always want to go to a wedding, but like, oh, pandemic and sickness and strangers and travel, like, you know, nobody outright said, oh, good, but there was some relief. And there's no rule that says you can't celebrate with them later when it's safe. So, for example, a lot of my dad's brothers and sisters live in Pennsylvania, and back when we were going to have our wedding at the first venue in the Poconos, that was easy for them. But when we changed our venue at the last minute back to this one in Nassau County, they were less excited about coming. You know, that's like a four-hour drive for a lot of them. And that four hour drive is probably not worth it for them if they're older and immune compromised. I know some of my dad's brothers and sisters have some health issues driving through the city just to get to the venue. And I understand, and I, I totally understand. So, so I told them, I told those aunts and uncles that, you know, when the virus is under control, whenever that may be, we'll have a little reunion. We'll have a family get together in Pennsylvania. And most people are fine with that. They are more than happy to accept a cancellation if it comes with an invitation to something else later that we know is going to be safe. You, you cancel with people with the added invite of a future celebration. When it comes to your guest list, you have to do everything you can to make sure that the people you're inviting are negative, or to the best of your knowledge, to the best of their knowledge. Do what you can to make sure that everyone attending is negative, but still prepare and treat the event as if everyone is positive. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, make sure everyone is negative, but treat everyone as if they are COVID positive. So in the weeks leading up to the wedding, we're talking to everybody, just double checking, do you have symptoms? How are you feeling? Have you been anywhere? Have you been exposed to anyone? When was the last time you got tested? Can you please get tested if you think you've been exposed and you're not sure? Obviously don't come if you start experiencing any kind of symptoms. And of course, wear your mask. Everybody that was invited and everybody that was planning on coming pretty much already knew that we were requiring masks. You know, every time we had changed a venue, we also sent new invitations saying like, just kidding, change of plans, now it's here. However, we're still requiring that everybody wear his masks. We're still following all the CDC guidelines. We're going to have sanitation stations and staff cleaning things. We're going to be doing social distancing. We're going to do everything we can. So people were constantly and regularly updated with these reminders of what we're doing to be safe and healthy. And at this point, three weeks before the wedding, everybody knew they had to wear a mask. There was just no two ways about it. We had been enforcing a mask requirement since we thought we were still having our original wedding at Woodlock. We also had to socially distance everybody, so how do we do that? Like I said, a lot of this was very lucky. It depends on your venue. We had a lot of options and a lot of space with our venue, Swan Club in Roslyn. So the little like chapel thing, whatever they call it, pavilion, was pretty wide. So we were able to socially distance the chairs for the ceremony. We kept some clumps of chairs together, like a clump of two or three chairs, a clump of four chairs, a clump of two, a clump of three, you know, little clumps so that same household families could sit together, so couples could sit together, so uh, friends who had already been hanging out or like safely interacting with each other during COVID could cluster together and be together. And every chair had 
a hand sanitizer on it. This was one of the things I did to be like safe and clean. I got bulk hand sanitizers and I got custom labels. So it looks like a party favor, but it is actually like helping you keep your hands clean throughout the day. So the moment you walk in, I mean, you get a glass of champagne, which was really cool of Swan Club. I, I didn't really even know about that little detail until later. Like, oh, they come in, they get champagne. Cool, great. But the second you sit down, you have your own personal individual individual hand sanitizer that you can keep on your person the whole night. So at any point, if you feel like maybe you touched something you shouldn't have touched, you can, you can sanitize right there. Like everybody has their own hand sanitizer and it looks cute. I tied little ribbons on it and I got the nice little stickers with our names and little whatever. So that was really cool. We were able to socially distance during the ceremony. People had their masks on. Our officiant stood a little bit behind us. We kind of had like a table separating us, but she had a microphone and we stood slightly in front. We did not have our masks when we were walking down the aisle and saying our vows, but the whole rest of the night, with the exception of eating and drinking, we also kept our masks on. I really do believe that the bride and the groom have to set an example. Like you have to show that you're serious about keeping your mask on and everybody else will follow because you know, the guests are thinking, oh, wow, well, you know, like, the bride and groom shouldn't have to wear their masks, like, they're the bride and groom, like, they, they should be the exception to the rule. No, nobody is the exception. The fact that my husband and I kept our masks on the whole time, like, that just reinforces, like, nobody is special here. Nobody gets to be the exception to the rule. Nobody is above this requirement. Everybody masks, unless you're seated in your area, eating and drinking, that's it, just mask. So I, I really do think that the bride and groom should enforce the mask wearing requirement. And you can have your maitre d' help you out with this also. I said to our maitre d', I was like, look, can you help us enforce the mask wearing? Like if you see anybody that's like tipsy or walking around or has it down below their chin, can you just like, you know, hey buddy, mask up. You, 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 you know, like, just help us out with that a little bit. And the maitre d' was like, yep, your wedding, you're the boss, if you, you know, your, your rules, what you say goes. So we move on to cocktail hour and the reception, and they were situated similarly. They were in two separate rooms, and as we were planning to have these people inside, we had to hash out some details with the venue. So ask your venue about their updated ventilation system. How are they circulating continuous fresh air inside? Are there easily accessible exits to step outside and get some fresh air if the guest wants to step outside for a breather? Are there little areas people can go and like step away from the crowd if they want to? Those things are important for when you're sitting inside. Again, this is something we got lucky with because this is a big wedding venue with big spaces and a lot of options. They also had the really big round tables that typically seat like 12 to 14 people. We decided we were only going to have six people per table and we even made a seating chart so it's like only couples sat together, like chairs close together, and then a space, and then, you know, another two chairs. So it was kind of like, kind of like the Mercedes symbol. You had, it was divided into thirds. So we had two, two chairs per couple, space, two chairs per couple, space, and then two chairs per couple. It was like that for both cocktail hour and the reception. And we grouped people together Again, same household families, and we kept friends together that we knew were already seeing each other and finding ways to, like, hang out during the pandemic. So we have a group of friends that, like, they were doing some backyard hangouts. We knew that, like, those were the only people that they were seeing. Like, they were already kind of like a same household family, even though they're not related they were just friends so we we just we put the friends together the couples together that we knew already knew each other and knew were being safe and responsible and like knew each other's business so they they would feel more secure and because it was a huge ballroom we were able to put so much space between these tables it was it was kind of ridiculous how big this ballroom was for only 46 people. You'd have to like get in your car to drive to the next table across the room. It was, it was really big. 
it it almost seemed excessive but in this case because of covid and social distancing it was ideal it it made everybody feel really safe to be that distanced from people they didn't know and to even have distance between them and the next couple and on each table this is another thing that i i came up with i had um, hand wipes, hand sanitizing wipes. Each table got packages of hand sanitizing wipes, and each table got um, latex medical grade powder free gloves. This was because our food was being served family style. It was an all vegan menu. I wanted everybody to be able to try a little bit of everything because I was really excited about having vegan catering. The catering was done by Blossom in New York City and the catering manager, Alex, is like the best person in the world. I love him so much. I still can't believe that he stuck with us through everything. He, he was originally willing to go all the way to Pennsylvania to work with us, then the garden, and now at Swan Club in Roslyn, he stuck with us through it all. So because the food was family style, there were three different entrees all coming out in like a big platter and then you would serve yourself. So I, I was even thinking like, oh, people are going to be touching the same spoons. You know, they're not breathing on the spoon, they're not licking the spoon, but they are touching the same spoon. So I was like, I have to make sure that, like, there is no doubt in anybody's mind that they are safe. So I gave every table the option of wearing latex gloves, they had the options of size medium or size large, and their hand sanitizing wipes so they could, and their personal hand sanitizers that they, that they got when they walked in the pavilion for the ceremony. So you could, you could hand sanitize your hands and then sanitize the spoon with the wipe and then put the glove over your hand before you touch the spoon if you wanted to. So each table also got that stuff. And most of the people did not use the gloves. I think only a few people used a pair of gloves and I only saw a few packets of the hand sanitizing wipes get opened. But I think the fact that it was all there, even just visually, seeing it and knowing that it's there, I think helped put our guests a little bit more at ease. And also, when people were seated for dinner, this was serendipitous. I did not plan this. I did not talk to the designer, decorator, or florist about any of this. In the center of the table, so, you know, my wedding is on Halloween and I'm going for like a spooky, ethereal forest vibe. Like if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings and you see the scene where they're walking through the Lothlorien forest and they meet the Lady Galadriel. Like that, that's what I want. I wanted to be Lady Galadriel and I wanted everybody to feel like they're in this like whimsical, ethereal forest. So I didn't really have bright, flowery decorations. I had like moody cool tones like branchy trees with fairy lights in them and like a lot of eucalyptus leaves and like amaranth flowers and stuff but in the center of each table was this like huge centerpiece of like these branches with fairy lights in them and granted you couldn't really see the person across from you but it did act as like a little bit of a barrier and, you know, if you go to a restaurant or if you go to a venue or if you go to a store, you know, sometimes there are glass or plastic or plexiglass partitions separating you from the other patrons. We didn't have plexiglass barriers, but we had this big, organic, branchy, leafy thing that still kind of acted as a little bit of a, of a buffer. So if somebody, like, you know, spit a little water droplet while they're eating or something, it's, it's gonna get caught up in, in this foliage, you know? So like, I didn't plan that, but it's just something I noticed when I, when I first saw the room. I was like, wow, these are really big. It's like, you can't really see the person sitting across from you. So that's, that's a little bit of a bummer, but it acted as like a natural, organic, and pretty uh, barrier. And I just thought that was really cool. It was like, I, I don't even know if, if our, our designer planned that, I don't know if he did. I don't know if he, he realized the, the brilliance behind the, the size and placement of those centerpieces, but that is an idea. If, if you really want to like disguise a barrier, decorate it, make it part of your decoration. 
We did require keeping the masks on during dancing. I know it sucks. I know nobody wants to do it, but you will be okay. I promise. I'm a ballet dancer. I, I do ballet classes and rehearsals with a mask on, and I have dysautonomia, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which means my, my brain does not always get the blood and the oxygen that it needs, even under the best circumstances. So if, if I can boogie all night long with my mask on, and I had a thick mask. I had like a thick silk mask with embroidery and beads on it to match my dress. I had a thick mask, and... Um, you know, if, if I did get a little lightheaded or out of breath, I would just sit down, get a sip of water, step outside, get some fresh air. Like, you, you are not obligated to dance to the point of exhaustion if the mask is making it hard for you to breathe. You do a little boogie, dance for one song, sit down for one song. But we did make everybody keep their masks on even while they were dancing. And I want to say, naturally... Only like 50% of our guests danced. I think some of them are just kind of shy. Like we have a lot of like nerdy, shy, socially awkward friends that might not have a ton of motor coordination. So even, even if there was no COVID, I feel like they wouldn't really be dancing that much anyway. They'd be in enjoying from the sides. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and maybe, maybe a handful of those people not dancing were also choosing not to dance just to be extra cautious, just to be extra safe and socially distanced, like, you know, not mix carbon dioxide with strangers on the dance floor. But I was dancing every opportunity I got, and I was dancing pretty close to some of my friends, and I was arm in arm and like waltzing with some of my dance company friends. I invited three of my friends from my ballet company, and so I was arm in arm with a lot of my friends that night, but we kept our masks on and, you know, we made sure like not to breathe on each other. And that was fine. Nobody passed out. If it, I, I sprained an ankle. I didn't sprain it. I twisted it. But like, you know, nobody, nobody was any worse for the wear because they had to keep their mask on while they were dancing. You do have to check in with everybody. Um, if you want to have a wedding during all of this COVID madness, it does mean you have to do a little bit of babysitting. You know, you can't just be drunk and oblivious to everything going on. If you want to have a wedding during this time, you have to make everybody else's health and safety and comfort your personal responsibility. So, you know, I I was kind of babysitting the room. I was hyper vigilant. I was making sure that everybody had their mask on. I was checking in with with everybody regularly. Are you feeling okay? Do you feel safe? Do you want me to move you somewhere more secluded? Do you want to sit somewhere else? Do you want some fresh air? Do you see anybody not wearing their mask? What can I get you? And I am already like that. Like, if I ever host a party, I'm never relaxing and enjoying my own party. I'm cooking for everybody. I'm cleaning as I go. I'm preparing drinks. I'm, I'm doing everything. So that's just in my nature to be like a helicopter host. Um, but you have to, you have to do that if, if you want to have a party during a pandemic, if you want to host an event during a pandemic, you, you are choosing to be liable for anything that happens. Everybody's health and safety is your responsibility for this party that you invited them to. So you do have to be hyper vigilant. And that constant communication and checking in with everybody has to keep happening even after the wedding is over. So my husband, myself, a random sample of friends all got tested a few days after the party, a week after the party, and two weeks after the party. So as these two weeks, because, you know, they say, like, symptoms show up two weeks, like, if you get COVID, you, you know, your symptoms will show up somewhere between 7 and 14 days, those were, those were the two weeks where we were, like, kind of holding our breath. And any time that somebody got tested, whether they had to get tested for work or whatever, we were like, tell me, what are your test results? What are your tests? And everybody was negative. This, this random sample that had to keep getting tested for work or for whatever, or, like, I, you know, my husband and I got tested 
almost immediately, like just to just to make sure we almost used ourselves as the guinea pigs because we were interacting with everybody. You know, you have to like shake everybody's hand and hug them goodbye. Like, you know, we're, we're talking to everybody because we're the bride and groom. So we thought if anybody was going to catch anything, it would be us because we're we we are having the most exposure to all the guests. We're having the most social interaction. So we got tested a few days after the wedding negative week after the wedding, negative, two weeks after the wedding, negative. And, you know, my, some family members and friends also were getting tested. So anytime we got news of negative test results, we would, we would update people. We let them know immediately. We were checking in with everybody. Hey, how are you feeling? Do you have any symptoms? D you know, how did you feel? Did you feel comfortable? Did you feel safe? Was Did anything happen that, that made you feel like maybe you, you were exposed? And unanimously, everybody was saying, no, I felt safe. I, I was a little hungover, but other than that, I feel great. Like, no symptoms, no cough, no nothing. And we'd be like, oh, Steve and I just tested negative. My sister just tested negative. This person tested negative. So far, everybody's negative. Everybody that we know of is still testing negative negative, no symptoms, you know, but let me know, stay in touch. And it does, it gets a little tiring. Like I'm going to admit it takes time to constantly be in communication with all of these people. That might be the one good thing about having a smaller guest list. It's a little more manageable to communicate back and forth with 45 people than it is to communicate back and forth with like a hundred people. Okay, so I hope that these tips, this advice, my experience uh, helped you or will help you if you're trying to power through COVID, if, if you have an event that you just cannot cancel or would break your heart to cancel, if you're determined to make it work, but you're determined to keep everybody safe and healthy, I really hope that this was able to answer some of your questions and thank you for sticking through this long video and if you would like to see some photos of our wedding I'm going to post them right now so you can either leave and say goodbye or stick around for some of our wedding photos. Thank you so much and be safe and be healthy.